So I'd like to introduce Tyler, who is our curator of contemporary art. Been here since February of 13. What inspired you to become a curator? Oh, that's a, that's a, you know, it's a mix of interest, you know, and what, maybe just following something in your life that, that you find kind of fascinating, and luck, happenstance, I think. Um, I was doing some research for my um, doctoral dissertation on an artist named Len Lai, who was from New Zealand, but ended up making these um, quite fabulous abstract films by painting on celluloid um, in the 1930s and setting those designs to sort of all kinds of music, a sort of gypsy jazz and uh, Latin American, Cuban uh, dance music. And, and then he moved to America and started making these kind of crazy kinetic sculptures. Um, essentially bits of steel attached to motors that would just kind of uh, waggle them around. And so I was, I was interested in this artist. My dissertation was around the idea of movement in the 1950s and 60s and, uh, and, and sort of how artists were relating to the spectator in those years. And uh, so this was a, a, a you know, chapter of my dissertation and it became six years of my life. Um, as after I finished a few weeks of research, they called me up again and said, um, there's this job of uh, curator of this collection. And um, so I, I, I left Cambridge, um, Massachusetts, and um, went to the other side of the world uh, to spend what I thought would be a couple of years, but ended up being quite a, a, an amazing journey. And part of that, um, and this is sort of maybe in relation to our new wing, there is also a building project um, to create something called the Len Lai Center attached to the Gavette Brewster Art Gallery, which is a public, publicly funded contemporary art museum. It says art gallery, but it does have a collection. Um, and, uh, and now um, that will open in about uh, a month, actually. They said it was going to open in 2008 when I got there, but, uh, but these things take time. Um, <laughs> Um, and I think the center is better off for it. Is, was there something particular about being a curator and what does that mean to you? I've always liked the idea of maybe speaking to a, a slightly broader audience than one does um, as an academic. Um, of course, you do get to talk to your students. Mostly you're talking to them. Um, but uh, uh, I just like the idea of making, of exhibition making, of um, having something that is a bit more open-ended than, say, an essay um, or a lecture. But, but just the idea that you could put some things in a room and th there could be a conversation between them and that people uh, could enter that space and be a part of that. Um, so, and also I liked just the idea of working in a, sort of a museum environment. Well, these days the word curate is thrown around a lot. People curate their picnic. How do you feel about that? You know, the, of course the word curator is related to the, you know, the French word curé, uh, like a priest, right? And I've always felt that as a curator you do have this sort of responsibility for the care of souls uh, in some, you know, in the fashion that we do. And, um, but strangely, maybe I should be more bothered by it, but I'm not, uh, <laughs> by the idea that a, to curate something is to pay attention to what is there and maybe make that somehow meaningful. It makes people a little bit more aware of what a curator does, who I've always felt is like the sort of producer on a movie. It's like, what does that person do? <laughs> They're sort of largely invisible when you walk into uh, an exhibition even that, that somebody's put together, but, um, and we don't often think of a curator behind it unless, I'm sure most people don't. Um, but I like the idea that we are the kind of um, in, invisible hand <laughs> moving things around. Um, do you remember the first time you visited a museum? I'm sure I was t far too young to actually remember the first time I was in a museum. 
but I do remember sort of, I don't know, standing in line at various exhibitions um, at the LA County Museum and at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. Um, and I still, when I go back to, uh, to LACMA, uh, there were always definitely certain paintings that I returned to again and again. There's a sort of still life of Cezanne's with, uh, I think it's peaches and cherries um, at, at LACMA. And I, I, you know, that's a place that I return to. Um, and I think that's something that museums do for us, is they give us maybe a sense of, of place. It's like you're not, not necessarily going to see that same collection of items in that same space, you know, um, anywhere else. So a museum is a kind of a unique experience that I think relates you to a place, and maybe that is why when we travel is when people go to museums so much. That's a thing that they do. Always had a membership, membership and, and that was uh, just of the part museum, of and so I could take the you know once I could drive, I could take the card and uh, and go um, to the museum for free. And I was lucky that I had a lot of friends who were sort of interested in doing that too, um, and who were not necessarily from you know a middle class background or anything, but were still very invested in literature and in art and sort of what was going on. And uh, so, yeah, you, you sort of fall into a crowd. And actually, I probably focused a bit more on visual art because all my friends were uh, poets and ah. writers. Um, and so that space was kind of occupied. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, so Columbus Museum of Art, and you're yeah. getting to know the collection. Yeah. Uh, especially with... Uh, so are you going to talk about the reinstallation a bit in your... I will. Okay. So, you know, God forbid... The museum's on fire. Oh yes, this and question. you have—you can save one. I'll give you two, two works of art. That's really hard. I know, but go for it. <laughs> Just don't think about it too okay. much. Okay, uh, Matisse. Um, Which Matisse? The, the Still, Still Life, Life with Lemons, um, uh, nineteen twenty-four, and Parakeets. Um, mm. That's one that I. Yeah. When I wander the museum, I kind of I find myself in front of that. And um, I also find myself in front of uh, the Weeping Willow of Monet's, yeah. uh, 1919. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, God forbid, uh, the yeah. museum should be on fire. Yeah. And, and, that know, will not happen. It's it, interesting that none of those are contemporary, sort That's of within yes, sort of post-war or contemporary. Um, but... You know, so is those artists that are still alive can they can make more. All right. <laughs> but so um, I have two more questions. Um, one is, um, what about I mean, as a contemporary curator? It's not just about the objects, but it's about the or is it or is it about the relationship with the artist for you? How big a role does that play um, in your work, and how important is that to you? Yeah, um, I suppose the. Curator is a bit of an intermediary between mm -hmm. the artist and the, you know, the public. Of course, when an artist is there in a studio making things, that idea of the public is, is always there. You know, the idea that this was will be seen, that this will go on, and have a life of its own, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And even if it never actually sees the light of day, there is still that notion that this is an object with its own existence and that can be seen by by somebody else. Um, and I suppose in my role as a curator, yes, I love dealing with, with artists and, um, you know, and the space of the museum itself, like that gallery space is something that I really uh, enjoy thinking about. Um, and I guess in the same way that an artist thinks about the public, the curator is the first visitor to an exhibition. Mm -hmm. And... Sure. Um, so every time I create a show or put something in a certain place, I'm always thinking about how one encounters those, the, that object and in what context. And what I guess we often talk about the conversation that's happening between two different works on a wall. And that's, again, something that most people don't think about. But, you know, uh, there is often some idea that is being expressed, uh, however abstractly, um, by placing an object 
next to another. Mm -hmm. And even the distance, you know, like uh, five inches, of course, you know, we're sort of stereotyped as the one is saying, two inches to the left, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but uh, sometimes two inches makes a difference. So, okay, I still have two more questions. Yes. So is... <laughs> no, this is, a, uh, no, this this is fun. fun. <laughs> um, so is, those conversations with an artist in the studio, though, that's a different conversation. Even when you're right. talking about it, that's a very different kind of conversation, isn't it? Yeah, and I really like the idea that, you know, well, artists, first of all, are, um, you know, always on that knife edge of moving forward, you know, of or always trying to push their own practice a little bit farther. And so when you come in as a visitor to the studio, you, you know, you have an influence on where that's going in some way, or you can. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's very nice to hear from an artist that, oh, thank you for that studio visit, actually gave me a lot to think about mm -hmm. in my own work. And so the idea that you know, whatever my little thoughts about somebody's work or some idea can actually um, get filtered into their practice somehow is, of course, very gratifying. So. Yeah. Last question. Um, so we, um, we, run in, we break into your house. Um, what book do you have on your nightstand? Um, it's probably a Dr. Seuss book. Okay, for Taya. <laughs> that isn't Taya. That's, that's honest. <laughs> Are you reading anything other than Dr. Seuss? Oh, I wish I were, okay. uh, to be honest. At the moment, yeah. God, you know, when you have a child. Okay, that's fair <laughs> enough. Dr. Dr. Seuss is a very good choice. Well, thank you for uh, allowing us to have a little glimpse. And oh. we will now drag the chairs away and um, oh. continue with and the we'll program. And fire up a PowerPoint. Oh, very good. This is the new CMA. Um, as I look at it on my desk, at my desk um, all the time, it's been really super exciting to see the, uh, this plan become a reality. Uh, every time I sort of come to work, I think, wow, they did that. Oh, that's finished now. And now it really does look like a building and the um, chain link fence has been brought down. And uh, it's a uh, it's really exciting moment. Um, and this is definitely one of the reasons that I decided that uh, Columbus was the place for me, was the idea that we were, we were really creating um, something fantastic here and that would, that would re remain for, uh, you know, hopefully in perpetuity um, as much as anything. Um, but of course, the main features, y y you may remember the 1974 edition. Um, I don't think a lot of tears were shed over, um, over the loss of that edition. Um, but uh, of course, we now have a, a new space, which includes gallery spaces and vent space and so on, a new garden and this uh, wing here. Now, I kind of uh, lucked out because that wing is well, it's debatable whether this was lucky, but uh, that, 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 um, I am essentially programming that whole wing for the uh, October opening. Um, so the two inaugural exhibitions, as well as the um, parts of the permanent collection that will be displayed um, in, in this space um, is are sort of my responsibility. The two temporary exhibitions are keeping pace uh, Eva Glimpscher and Pace Columbus. Many of you may be uh, famil more familiar with Pace Columbus than I, but it was a, a gallery. So Pace Gallery is now a kind of international, Im very important uh, uh, gallery with eight different um, sort of branches uh, all over in England, uh, New York, Los or California and uh, China even, but between 1962 and sorry 1965 and 1982, there was Pace Columbus, um, run by a very charismatic figure named Eva Glimscher, who had moved to Columbus to be with uh, three of her children. Um, she and one of her other children, Arnie Glimscher, 
um, had started Pace Gallery in Boston in 1960. Um, and so we'll be looking at the, at the history of that gallery and some of the artists that showed there. Um, as, at the same time, another exhibition uh, called Imperfections by Chance, a Paul Feely retrospective, and I'll talk a bit more about Feely. Um, of course, installations from the permanent collection. And I, if there's time, I might give you some hint of what's coming in February 2016, um, an exhibition that is coming to us from the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, uh, uh, Melvin Edwards, Five Decades. Uh, this uh, is a bird's eye view of those galleries. This is the, the top floor. Um, we have had th these walls here aren't actually part of the, the architecture itself, but something that we have spent uh, many, many hours debating uh, about where exactly these walls should go, how high they should be, um, all the little bits around, uh, around making a building. Um, there are three entrances to the galleries. Um, and this is the lower level where the temporary two, uh, where the ex temporary exhibition space is. Um, the Paul Feely show will be both downstairs and upstairs as part of it. Um, the Pace show will be in the bulk of the bottom floor. And then on this side here, so this is Broad Street here, um, on this side will be uh, elements from the, for the permanent collection. But there are six artists whose work is the really focusing on, who showed at Pace Columbus. Um, Jim Dine, Jean Dubuffet, Louise Nevelson, Lucas Samaras, Frank Stella, and Andy Warhol. This is an Andy Warhol piece uh, from 1980 featuring Arne Glimscher, that's Eva Glimscher, um, and that's Fred Mueller, who also started Pace Gallery. Um, and there, as I mentioned, that's sort of where it'll be. Um, some, some sneak peek of the gallery. This is sort of the way I work in this three-dimensional sort of virtual reality. Um, it's a kind of fun to play around with and you can uh, put things sort of anywhere, but uh, ultimately they do. So as you can see, it's like I have a pretty good sense of where th I, things are going to go as I'm making this. And it's quite amazing to have this sort of virtual space become a, a reality once you walk into it. Um, uh, Poster, you know, of course, these are not the only artists that showed at Pace uh, Columbus. There were uh, many, many others. And as you um, walk into many collectors' homes in, um, in Columbus, you do find, you know, these artists' works. Uh, so it's uh, been interesting to get to know some of, some of these collectors who have, who have bought out of Pace Columbus. And if any of you bought out of Pace Columbus, please let me know. Uh, <laughs> I'm always um, interested in, in people's experiences or work that might have come out of the gallery. Uh, Jim Dine was from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he was born in the mid-1930s, 35 or 37, I want to say. Um, and, of course, was showing you know, daring collages cause controversy. It's always um, fascinating you know, work that, um, you know, these sort of going into the Columbus Dispatch uh, archives and sort of pulling out some uh, different um, exhibitions and, and, you know, the idea that, that these are daring works and that cause some controversy in, in town is quite fascinating. It's not, um, especially when you you know, from I think contemporary eyes have gotten used to seeing um, work um, like this. We we'll also have uh, Jean Dubuffet, um, who is not from Ohio, um, but, but French, <laughs> um, and uh, showed some of the uh, sort of the Orloop um, cycle um, at Pace Columbus. This is another work that was shown there. There are two, this is a seat avec uh, du personnage, um, site with two people. There's a prof face and profile there, and another f a more frontal image. Also have L Lucas Samaras. This is a work from uh, the Columbus Museum of Arts collection, um, courtesy of Herb and Didi Glimpscher. And this is another work that is uh, not in our collection, but uh, uh, was shown at Pace Columbus. Um, 
uh, I think during this 1976 exhibition uh, called Green Shadow, and there are portraits of uh, Mrs. Glimpshire. I'm not sure exactly yet which one it is. I have to get some, uh, uh, maybe Arnie to point it out to me. But uh, um, another big feature, prominent feature of this show will be uh, this work, Doorway, uh, from conceived in 1966, but only executed in 2007. So that was there will be some works that were not shown at Pace Columbus, but are sort of representative of these artist practices. Um, this is a doorway, but you can't actually enter into it. Uh, some artists' work has often been about, well, there's some, something very almost visionary about it. Um, uh, this sort of uh, is 1968, um, I believe, uh, mirror room is a, a, a sort of a mirrored box like this, 10 feet by 10 feet, and you could actually go inside, and there is a table and a chair um, inside, which are also covered in mirrors. Um, and so as you walk in there, you have this sort of infinite space, and your reflection is also infinite. And I think, you know, probably this was conceived, as, for, for Samaras anyway, as a kind of distribution of the body, you know, it's sort of like your body itself has become sort of spread out and it entails a kind of a loss of self almost. But of course in, in practice, as you, it's, um, as I called it, a kind of selfie machine, um, as if, you know, people are in there and taking, so there is another aspect, the self is maybe not as uh, um, easily disintegrated as we uh, might imagine, but it sort of comes back. But it'll be interesting to see how um, you know how this will will function in the gallery. There you go. That kind of infinite repetition, an infinite space. There's also a, a Kenneth Nolan and Frank Stella exhibition at Pace, and we will have some works out of that. Uh, the Athletes series of Andy Warhol was shown both at Pace and um, at the Columbus Gallery of Fine Arts. Here is, um, here is some photographs by James Friedman of Warhol in, uh, at the Columbus Gallery of Fine Arts in 1978. So that's a, just a quick romp through uh, uh, the uh, Keeping Pace. Uh, and I will take you through a bit of uh, the Paul Feely retrospective, which is something that I co-curated um, with the senior curator em emeritus uh, Douglas Dreischboon at the Albright Knox Gallery, our art gallery. This is Paul Feely. Um, that's about 1962. Um, this is a somewhat earlier image from the 1950s. Uh, that's Feely. Um, Helen Frankenthaler, Jackson Pollock, uh, behind that tree, unfortunately, Lee Krasner, who's Pollock's uh, wife, and uh, Clement Greenberg there. Um, Feely is lesser known than uh, practically all of those other figures, but he was uh, very much a, a sort of part of this circle around the New York School. And this is an exhibition, it's the first show uh, retrospective of Feely's work since 1968. Um, at the Solomon Guggenheim Museum in New York. And he was, a, so Feely was actually a, a, a professor at Bennington College, small women's liberal arts college in Bennington, Vermont. And he, Helen Frankenthaler was a student of his, and she went on to kind of uh, befriend uh, all of this circle around the New York school, which Feely himself had, he had been a, a Marine during World War II and was one among the first to enter the town of Nagasaki after the, uh, after the bombing, um, which perhaps contributed to his quite early death of uh, leukemia in 1966. But, but Frankenthaler was a, a friend of Feely's and brought a, a lot of, uh, of these people, particularly Clement Greenberg, back to Bennington. And Feely had a very important role in the school and did the first exhibition of Jackson Pollock's work um, in a public institution in 1951. Um, he later did a very important exhibition of uh, Barnett Newman's, um, David Smith. I mean, this town of Bennington became a very sort of a kind of cultural outpost or a cultural center unto itself, um, although quite far off the beaten track um, from Manhattan. 
So here are some of his works. They are, this is the installation at the Albright Knox last year. As you can see, there are sort of, he's been sort of pegged as a color field artist, um, but his concerns are a little bit different. He was interested in experimenting with ways of making pictures often, and he did use this kind of stain technique that uh, is familiar from Helen Frankenthaler's work, where she thinned out the, the paint and let it soak into the canvas, and you, so you could really see the weave of the canvas and the surface uh, of a canvas is um, sort of, he's interested in breaking it up into a kind of figure and ground, and these sort of reversals of what is behind something else. Um, so this is a, uh, you know, a sort of wave, it's a, but the interplay between this kind of red field and the blue as you're standing in front of this painting, uh, they're kind of constantly sort of switching places. In the same way that you see like this fam quite famous image of a vase which has two sort of figure, uh, two profile figures, it's that sort of switching back and forth that Feely was quite interested in. So, but also between abstraction and representation. So, and often tied to the body in some way. Um, so, I don't, I don't know, I tend to think of these as sort of like, uh, like fingers or knuckles or something like this, sort of something intertwined. Um, but uh, this is also a kind of hokusai sort of way from like a Japanese 19th century print that he was interested in. But there's all kinds of little references in Feely's work. Um, this work is called The Other Side from 1957. Um, and it's called The Other Side because Feely painted it on both sides of the canvas. What, this blue is actually the same sort of color paint as this blue, but it was painted on the other side of the canvas. And what we see is that color bleeding through. Um, so that sort, of, that sort of thing. And his interest in space took him to create some... Um, sculptural works toward the end of his life in 1965. Here's a couple of more uh, images from the installation of that. I'm revealing too much. This should also be a surprise. This is a bit like a... Uh, but it's, think of it as a, a sort of trailer to the exhibition. Um, um, but yes, it'll, this will be the upstairs um, galleries, and you can see some of the sculptural works um, here and here. Um, this one is uh, quite important, actually. This is a maquette from 1966, the last year of Feely's life, of a, of a larger work called Sculpture Court, or Karnak. It was um, made, this is it, in 1968, in the atrium of the Guggenheim Museum. And this is a work that will become more and more familiar to you as we are installing it, um, uh, sort of, actually, a reconstruction of it um, right here on Washington and Gay Streets outside of the of the new wing, um, and it will be there as a gift from a uh, a donor who is currently anonymous, as well as the Feely Estate. So, and uh, that will become a real feature of the uh, you know of the Columbus Museum of Art, and I think a, r a really exciting one as well. So the Philly exhibition, in some sense, is giving a context for people to understand this work that they will live with for, for uh, quite a few more years. Uh, that is a kind of nice segue to a few more of works that will be part of the reinstallation of the permanent collection. Um, this was the, uh, the most mysterious photograph of Mel Chin's spirit, otherwise known as the Big Barrel. Um, <laughs> that, uh, that I could find, but, uh, but that, as well as uh, Alison Sars' Nocturne Navigator, uh, which hopefully will be much, you know, sort of presented in a manner. Both of these works we're hoping to present um, in a much better sort of installation than, than we had previously been able to do. So hopefully they will see these works both um, you know, as returning, but returning in, their full, in full glory. <laughs> Another work that we... Um, was one of the first uh, acquisitions that I 
uh, helped move along with as, and when I got here. As part of my honeymoon period um, as a curator, I said, let's you know, acquire this work. You may remember at the Wexner Center there was a quite a large exhibition of Josiah McElhinney's work in uh, 2013, and this was sort of one of the centerpiece uh, uh, artworks from that show. It's called Three Screens for Looking at Abstraction. And what you see, oh, it's, there are three kind of floor-to-ceiling structures which are made of mirrors and projection cloth. Um, this one is mirrors inside, and, and there is another one. There's these kind of three elements, each with a, with a projection on them. And one can project any abstract film from the history of abstraction onto these works. So it's a piece that can constantly be reinvented. As you, as you come into the gallery one year, it will be a different program altogether than another. And in some sense, it's a work that is all, could be always up, but also always be changing according to how you've, uh, how you've programmed the films to display on it. And it's really quite, um, quite seductive and be a kind of beautiful object, but it also exists as a kind of a lens for, I think, in the, in the artist's uh, own intention for maybe like one person's subjective history of abstraction. So it exists as a kind of uh, manifestation of maybe somebody's memories of films, abstract films that they that are kind of that they feel close to. Uh, so I will be programming the first uh, the first round, but there will be others around uh, both Columbus and and uh, and elsewhere who will uh, have a chance to kind of select or curate, shall we say, the film selection for this for this program. Lastly, I'll mention another. Uh, 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 um, I don't have any proper images of it because it is um, something you won't be able to see very much. Uh, an installation of a sound sculpture by uh, the artist Susan Phillips, who is from uh, Scotland. The work is called Study for Strings. It will be placed in the garden uh, along this wall here, sort of this section of the wall. And it consists of um, 12 speakers. There are 12, uh, it's a sort of an array of 12 speakers, each with their own channel, their own sound. Their in, each one is sort of, has its own sound. And those sounds come from, they're selected from a, a viola and cello. Um, but the piece of music that they draw upon was uh, by a, a composer, was actually a piece called um, Study for String Orchestra that was composed um, in the Theresienstadt concentration camp in um, the 19, early 1940s and was uh, actually performed in the camp by a string orchestra. Of course, many of the people who actually um, you know, performed that piece of music at the time were subsequently uh, killed. So what Susan is a kind of homage to this piece of music has selected just the pieces for um, just the viola recorded, just the viola and the cello portions of it. And she recorded each note individually. So the person would play just say the A flat and just do the A flat and then wait for the next A flat and then play that and wait for the next one and play that. Um, and that becomes one channel one speaker. So with 12 speakers, there are 12 notes that will be played, each one with an one individual note, an A-flat or a B or what G or what have you. It's a very beautiful uh, piece of music both, that is both, you know, somewhat somber, but also just inspires some reflection on life itself, on history, a history that is, you know, rapidly sort of fading away in some ways um, in terms of the, the people who were um, in directly and personally involved with this period of time. So, um, and the Fabric of Survival exhibition that is up now, it kind of relates to exactly this kind of question. Coming on the heels of those exhibitions and installations it will be this show, Melvin Edwards, Five Decades. Uh, this is Melvin. Um, <laughs> 
Uh, he, looks, he looked a little stern in that photo, so I thought I'd take one um, from his website. And this is uh, Melvin Edwards in, in Dayton, Ohio, in 1957, as a child. So he has a kind of connection um, to this uh, general area. He, but he is, uh, was born in Houston and has spent most of his uh, life um, in Los Angeles as well. And he is a, uh, known as a sculptor, um, and primarily working with welded steel. Perhaps this is some of the uh, installation shots from the Nasher. Might be best known for these works here, which are called Lynch Fragments, and which he began making in, uh, I believe, 1964, and continues to this day. Um, many of them, um, they're sort of on the wall, and they seem not so much like masks, but they, uh, as I've sort of put it before, they have a kind of anthropomorphic appearance to them. They're made of different household kind of objects, often a lock or a chain um, or some other, like a hammer, um, other uh, things that might be around in some kind of junkyard. And he assembles them, welds them together, often with the intense heat, they kind of bend and meld very much into one another but they take on this almost like face-like appearance. So and, oh, at once they, you know, some of them do refer to the violence of a lynching, say, uh, they're called lynch fragments, but also other uh, political events like the Vietnam War or the Iraq War indeed. Um, uh, but they are at once, you know, very powerful, um, in their sense of violence, almost, there is a strong underpinning, but there's also something very human about them. Um, and it's, uh, they're, they're quite, have a very fascinating so sense of presence, um, I think. Melvin Edwards also had a, a very important 1970 exhibition at the Whitney Museum of Art, in which he made some barbed wire pieces that relate to architecture, and which essentially use the same sort of language of um, min the minimalism of, um, say, Donald Judd, uh, for example, with these kind of repeated forms, um, but using a very um, evocative material like barbed wire. And there is, you know, this one's called Steel Life, um, you know, which is a kind of, uh, an indication that they do have, there is a sense of, as I said, sort of, a uh, kind of power and violence to them, but there is also this sense of humanity and even humor to them as well. And, uh, and one other reason to bring this exhibition to Columbus is that since 1982, Columbus has uh, actually had a um, quite a, a large outdoor public sculpture of Melvin Edwards. It is on, um, it's in Mount Vernon Plaza, uh, not too far away from here. But it's been there since, uh, since 1982 and is entitled From the Struggles of the Past to a Brilliant Future. So there is, as I said, a kind of Columbus connection, both with uh, Dayton, uh, you know, his youth in Dayton, as well as, as this, which has been here for some decades now. That's pretty much uh, you know, um, you know, that trailer of uh, coming attractions. And I, I, hope, uh, I hope I haven't spoiled it for you. Um, exactly, but, uh, but when you do see it, you maybe perhaps have a sense of, you know, some of the thinking that went into making these exhibitions and, uh, and you know, maybe that invisible hand of the curator will sort of be revealed a little bit more. Um, but I hope that you, uh, you know, are here for the opening celebrations and come back many, many times and, uh, and explore the, these exhibitions um, on your own. So I hope you enjoy the shows. <laughs>